notion of a haunted ship that's been missing for many years that actually brings out the greed and avarice of five ordinary people is a really intriguing one. The story's about a salvage crew on a tug who come across a abandoned 1950s ocean liner. Things start to go wrong and they find themselves in, in hot water basically. There's clearly uh, activity going on on the ship and it's pretty scary. The sh ship is, uh, shall we say, it, it's not abandoned. They're looking for fortune and instead they come across mayhem. <laughs> There's a haunting that's going on. Lots of screams <laughs> in the night. I always sort of saw it as the shining meets dead calm. The Mara Celeste, the Bermuda Triangle, it ties into all those kind of areas. I think if you're in for a good scare, this is the one to see because it's really horrific. People are gonna really be scared and they're gonna love it. We like to shock you and I, I think this is full of that. You are in a graveyard. You should know that and you should leave. I like spooky films. Films that are eerie and unsettling. They're good movies that I've always liked to go see. I was brought up in Ireland, so um, I've known a lot of seafaring men telling you stories about um, ships that disappeared under the sea and cities that were buried underwater and strange women that lived in rooms way out in the ocean. There's something restless about the character, something hidden about all those men. I find people who live like that fascinating. With success of movies like Sixth Sense and the others, you're, we're seeing that ghost movies can go beyond just, you know, teenage horror fare. They can be pretty scary and, and interesting and smart, and we're trying to do that with this one. I can't hold her much longer, Murphy. The port bottle of healing, she's taking on way too much water. We're what we call salvagers. We are hired to find ships that have either sank or ships that have gotten in trouble. It's not a glamorous life, obviously. It's a lot of work. It's days at a time at sea, and uh, it's dirty and smelly, and not, not a lot of places um, would find women there. But there's something incredibly um, heroic about it. Oh, hey. They're just kind of like a tough bunch of people. They put their nose out on the line for each other, and they, they, you know, they work together as a team, and a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Hi. Right, uh, Hi, Mr. Murphy. I'm Jack Ferryman. I was wondering if I could buy you a drink. We are introduced to a character who has this incredible uh, opportunity. I was out in the middle of the street, and I came across this. I, I did three flybys and tried for radio contact and got nothing, so I figured she had to be addressed. Have you told anyone else about it? No, let me so. I've seen strange things happen in the street. I know something else. C gives you an opportunity, you take it. It should only be a week out of our way home. We're on our way back to Alaska, and it really should only be about a week out of our way. And um, most of us don't end up going home. The issue is really the storytelling and how, how to tell a good story, how to tell it with a lot of scares, how to make people sit up and pay attention to the movie. Shit! this incredible ship called the Antonio Graza, which has apparently been floating around for 40 years. Oh, now do you believe me? Holy shit. It's mammoth. You, we think we see it, and then we don't see it, and then all of a sudden we slam right into it. It's the Antonio Graza. Jesus Christ. This is civilian tugboat Arctic Warrior. You know her, Murphy? Only in my dreams. And that's when you start wondering what's going on in this the plot thickens. I think audiences are going to go and see this movie for a thrill, to see something that they've never seen before. I mean, just the mere visual of this 1950s rusty ship appearing out of the mist and dwarfing the tug Arctic Warrior is a visual that I, I haven't seen on cinema yet. 
at the height of its day, it was the, the opulence of ocean-going, you know, travel and leisure. It's very luxurious. It was a, it was the fashion of its heyday. It is, of course, like most things in fashion, fallen decrepitly by the wayside. It has even deteriorated to the point of just being a rusted hulk. Welcome aboard. I'm Julie. I'll be your hostess this evening. The love boat. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Soon I'll when the frights come, they almost happen sequentially, one right after the other, just having them stacked up and not letting the audience rest till you get through everything, and then give them a brief moment of time to think about it, what's happened before you introduce another one. So they find this old ship that is rusted on the inside for the most part, but still huge and tons of things uh, that could be sold in it, and then they find a huge amount of gold. Oh, shit! <laughs> And then they begin to uncover traces of who might have left the gold there and then why. Things just start getting out of hand. And the moral of the story, I think, is that greed ultimately gets you nowhere. As people start revealing what they're really about under this kind of pressure, you know, who are you really and what really matters? So it really kind of comes down to the human reaction to things such as greed and such as lust and such as the other issues at hand. And especially once that hook is set, it's a slow reel in. All you need is a couple of beats here and there and then some, some music and then a scare which I've counted at least by 47, close to 50 some odd scares in this movie. So you're gonna have the suspense. Bob Zemeckis and myself had this idea, well Bob really had the idea to remake uh, House on Haunted Hill. And as we were preparing it, Bob thought, look, it would be really fun if we could maybe make more of these pictures. House on Haunted Hill was good and successful and 13 Ghosts was more successful. We want to keep going. We're trying to, you know, have one of these movies come out every Halloween. The intention was to make really good quality pictures, pictures that will scare people and just keep it going, keep it moving, keep the pacing of it really, really well paced. You have a lot of action, you have a lot of characters that have a lot of arcs. A lot of us have really put a lot of effort into really building character in a film that normally doesn't require it. I think with all these great actors, we've been able to create people that you're going to care about within the horror of the film. It's a man of Murph, huh? It's about the sensation. It's about the hit of the, the, the visceral experience. I mean, that's what these guys are good at, you know? If you're going to do a horror movie, you do it with them. So this is the thriller that's going to, I think, have people jumping. <laughs> What we try to do is to get as much character work in there as possible and we try to establish different types of people that are aboard the boat. Epps is kind of the backbone of the crew and it's heart and she's iron, you know, iron cast and strong as a hurricane. She is a woman in a man's world, but there's definite respect because she's really good at what she does. The interesting thing about my character is she doesn't really care much about the gold. Her life is this. She's a classic hero. She's the person you look to when you're in trouble. That's who everyone looks to like Sigourney Weaver's character in Avon. Katie started out as an, as an innocent who died as part of this whole thing. Um, and over time, what she has sort of morphed into is somebody that's a bit more complex. All the other ghosts, when they die, they sort of turn evil. But Katie's innocent, and she sort of helps the crew to find out about the ship. This little girl's been trapped in this ghost spirit for a long time. I think Katie would like to get her revenge sooner or later. And I think she finally finds that ability within Epps. I want to show you something. Katie's sort of like her little guide. You know, in Dante's Inferno, Virgil guides Dante through hell. And um, in a way, she guides eps through hell and gets her out the other side. The sets on this film have been unbelievable. The art direction is truly remarkable. This is one of the 
probably the, the most impressive set I've ever, I've ever worked on. This is a work of brilliance. I'm continually being very impressed by, by Grace Walker's work. His sets are just incredible. He's built this fantastic ocean liner, which of course we see in its glory, and we see it, you know, like this after it's been sitting derelict in the ocean for 40 years. So it's it's a pretty incredible transformation. They wanted a ship that was of that classic 50s liner. We modeled it on the Andrea Doria, which was one of the Italian lines. So it was quite a challenge, especially as it goes through many phases of decay, uh, right from when it was a pristine ship. What we wanted to do with the ship, as opposed to you know your typical haunted house movie, we wanted to give it a layering of wet texture, a waterborne demonology, if you will. As the actors, we'd walk around sometimes and you just want to tell the camera, come film over here, come film over here. The rust, the way everything is glistening, and I mean, it's just remarkable. You really feel like you're on the boat. And then to transform it back into 1960s and see what it looked like when it was new and beautiful, it's just been a pleasure. His designs are fabulous. There is so much intensity and richness and believability in those sets that it makes you know, the bit of icing on the cake, that is visual effects, uh, it makes that job so much easier. Steve was looking for someone who didn't default to a digital solution every time there was a visual effect required. From the outset, Steve was very strongly of the view that a, a large miniature ship would be used. That was almost a, you know, a stated requirement of the equation. Steve comes from the world of special effects, and this is a movie that is very heavy in special effects. He's really great at that understanding of what it takes to make a film like this work. You have to do a lot of homework with that stuff. You have to prepare a lot for it. Whatever you can control and have prepped, people aren't guessing for it, and, and the shots essentially come out better. Dale's been watching our hind end quite a bit, actually, lately. Photon has a huge job ahead of themselves. Uh, there's quite a bit of work to do on this film. The objective always is the same, is to create a credible illusion. The one thing that we have to do is, with this picture is to keep the scale large, keep the scale big. And we feel that they're going to give us some things that you've never really seen on a, in a movie before. Come on. Big death, big death. Ready? Cameras. Wait, wait, uh... <laughs> These kind of movies require a certain amount of shock value to them. The guy goes into a darkened room, you go, don't go in there, don't go in there, there's bad things. You're waiting to be scared as an audience. So we've kind of created a ship full of dark rooms and let that opportunity sort of leap out at people. With this picture, we're really topping ourselves with frights and scares, and I think the audience is going to be in for a great ride. This has the chance to be something that really has some good, scary moments. And, you know, you leave, you've eaten your popcorn, you had your soda, and you, you go see it again. <laughs> I think there's going to be a few surprises in there. It's very difficult these days to be original, but I haven't seen or read anything like this. I think the shock value is going to be uh, quite huge. The visual effects, the traditional scare stuff, the blood, the gore, the macabre, but yet the storyline, it all comes together. It's got twists and turns that you don't see coming. We try very hard to, to come up with twists that you don't see, that you don't feel that are, that, that are gonna be there. I think they're just gonna love the fear factor of it, because you're not gonna know what's gonna happen, and the visual effects are stunning. It's gonna be a lot of fun, and I'll watch this movie on Halloween, that's for sure. You'll probably be seeing us every Halloween for some number of years to come.
One of the things we learned on the previous pictures that we did, namely 13 Ghosts, was that we had a glass house and we decided we will never see or build the glass house from the outside. What would happen if we never really had a boat? We created the boat in special effects land. Grace Walker had a great idea for the picture. He immediately understood that we wanted the, 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 the movie to be a, a millennium picture, but we wanted the boat to be from the 60s. And crews up here have a great ethic about the work, uh, probably better than any place else in the world that I've worked. We just kind of stumbled into this brilliant, these brilliant art departments here in Australia. The economics are terrific. We can do a lot more construction and a lot more building, and they do a phenomenal job, so we're really lucky to be here. So it was quite a challenge to do something that was on a pretty nice ocean liner, especially as it goes through many phases of decay, uh, right from when it was a pristine ship. At the outset of pre-production, Grace and I went through several, several books, did a lot of research on that era of, uh, of sailing, um, and found out just how much of a wealth of opportunity there was with the stylism involved. Now how do we take that and convert it over to that other aesthetic? How do we make it you know, far more moodier and far more atmospheric? We just looked at you know, ways of combining those two issues together and coming up with our ship design. This is the ballroom, and this is how we open in this ballroom, which is a pretty magnificent way to open the film. It's fairly large and quite sumptuous. I thought for this it would be great to really open it up and, and go to this scale. It's uh, heavily marbleized, uh, marble floor and columns and I love marble, so... <laughs> What we wanted to do with the ship, as opposed to you know your typical haunted house movie, we wanted to give it a layering of wet texture. So everywhere aboard the boat, everywhere where ferryman is, all the things that take place under those conditions have that aspect of water to them. And what we've tried to do is essentially create a waterborne demonology, if you will. I think it was a bit of aging and just a crepiness in how far we were going to accept the decay of the ship. We held back in a lot of cases with actual architecture, but pushed even further and farther forward with the accoutrement, the furniture, the plates, the dishes, the curtains, the, the windows, the glass. And once we kind of went down that road, we were able to say, okay, it's been through hell, it's been through a gigantic storm, so all of the furniture, all the tables and chairs would have washed over to the starboard side of the ballroom, and that's where they'll be. One of the largest set pieces is the um, a full-size bow that we're building on a barge. So we get re interaction with the, the tug there on the real tug and the bow. Um, it's, it's enormous. I mean, it's full size. We could have shot it as a miniature, but frankly, it was never going to look as good. And you were never going to have that opportunity of really kind of casing everything and selling the illusion. This is the bridge. Of course, the higher we get up to the into the elements, the heavily I went with, you know, the uh, degradation of things. The, the uh, carnage is probably even greater than here than, say, in the ballroom where, you know, it's down below, it's not, rain doesn't get in and it's away from the wind and ice and et cetera. I like the ship's bridge quite a bit. I thought it was very atmospheric and very just sort of bizarre and creepy. It had just a lot of elements about it that just reminded people of, like, you are in a graveyard. You should know that and you should leave. He's 
built this fantastic, incredible ocean liner, which of course we see in its glory, and we see it, you know, like this after it's been sitting derelict in the ocean for 40 years. So it's it's a pretty incredible transformation. And that's for a designer a, a great it's a great blast, really, being able to bring to fruition everything I could have possibly wanted to be. This is Jason Beard, who owns JMB FX Studios, and I'm Howard Berger from KB EFX from KB EFX Group Inc. Here we are making uh, a lot of blood and guts and mayhem for the movie Ghost Ship. I think what I like best about prosthetic stuff is that it's actually practical stuff that has to get built. You can touch it, you can feel it. It takes artists to create it, you know. Um, you have sculptors and mold makers and painters and mechanics and, and makeup artists. And, you know, on this show it just happens to be bodies and a lot of gore stuff and all that. But it can be, you know, you can be on a show where you have to make monster stuff or, or a subtle makeup or an age makeup or something really done an animal. And it also has that look about it on film as well that digital stuff doesn't have. It's, it's got a raw texture to it. You know, we've seen so much CGI. We've seen so many u uses of the technologies to create some of these supernatural things that we find that some of these things work better when you just go back to humans and go back to and have, and have the frightening moments come out of something that people can really empathize with by feeling like, I think I'm talking to you. Are you human or are you a ghost? Howard Berger and Jason Beard have both sort of succeeded immensely at what they've done, which is provide the film with a bit of shock value. And they both sort of understand the medium, if that's the right way of putting it. <laughs> the sticky red medium. Well, in the first 10 minutes, 80 people get killed, so. And we see them all get chopped up and hacked up. You know, you have your lead characters, and... and uh, Nearly all of them die. So. Yeah, one by one. We had an initial storyboard sequence that Steve Beck had done, and we were asked to go back in and add to it um, and, and make a little more sense out of the whole, uh, the whole catastrophe of the, of the opening of the film, this whole four-deck sequence, it's called. The cut happens within you know, less than a second, whoosh, slices through all these people, 80 people. And, um, and then bodies fall apart in creative, comical, horrific ways. And Joel Silver kept referencing an effect that we, we worked on uh, in 13 Ghosts, where this one character, Ben, uh, who's the uh, lawyer, gets sliced in half and just kind of slide, first half slides down and then the second half slides down and we see it all and that got a really huge response in the film and Joel wanted that times 80 times 100. Actually originally it was everybody got decapitated and then the studio went no decapitations. So then it went to slicing everybody here and we wanted then to have the captain get it in, in a real specific way, something that was different than all the other people and we thought okay, he'll maybe bend down to save the little girl and takes the wire right across his mouth. So in that four deck sequence, we see him holding her. They're the last remaining, you know, live people standing there amongst thousands or hundreds of dead bodies and blood and guts everywhere. And we look up at the captain and this blood, this bloodline just kind of starts to grow and he leans over and the top of the head falls off onto the little girl. And I mean, I don't know really what the difference is between lobbing somebody's head off and lobbing somebody at the torso and mm -hmm. having more blood and guts exposed and spray and, out. And then lobbing someone off at the mouth. Yeah. yeah, but that was a special thing we had a really sell Joel Silver on that one. You know, it's a combination of our stuff, our practical stuff, and then digital stuff that uh, Photon uh, here is um, responsible for. So. I think you have to start first with a couple of very sick puppets like Jason and Howard, you know, very sick men to come up with these concepts. The objective is to try and get an animated human style face and, and, and subtle nuances of reactions and musculature on a, an otherwise inert prosthetic. We were able to determine how to make the actor uh, uh, from whom the prosthetic cast have been made move in the same way that the prosthetic would or at least make their face move in the same way as the prosthetic face would move. We have scanned the head so that we can massage and manipulate that uh, if we need to create patches or transitions between prosthetic and live action. We have to leave! Then we had quite a few makeup effects uh, to do with Santos as one of the characters and he gets blown up and comes back as a ghost with horrible burns all over half of his body. Um, also, initially, we, we started uh, uh, with um, some rotting corpses. 
It's all about you know making the making the bodies look as real as possible. Doing a lot of fine detail, you know, with eyes and teeth and and hair punching and all that sort of stuff. We also did a replica dummy of the character Murphy, played by Gabriel Byrne. He's dead in a tank, in a, in a huge fish tank full of water, so it was an effect that the actor couldn't have physically done himself, so we did a, a replica of him. There's an effect where Francesca, she gets a hook in the neck, so the hook comes flying through camera and digs her up under the chin and, and lifts her off, it, off her feet, and so, we did a, it was a combination of um, rigging and stunts and, and myself to get her actually swinging backwards and forwards to look like, you know, she was actually hanging by her neck. So um, we did a, a, a big prosthetic neck section and a fake hook and bloodlines and stuff. So that was, when we saw the rough cut of that, it was, it was very, very cool. The one thing that we have to do is with this picture is to keep the scale large, keep the scale big. We have an ocean liner, we have a tugboat that you know, looks like a very you know, macho tugboat. It's not just a tugboat that you might see in New York Harbor ferrying boats around, but it's really got a personality and a feel to itself. So to keep that vastness, to keep that scope, you know, required us to, to think a different way about doing it. Photon is a company in Australia that we have great respect for, and we've had a great collaboration with them, and we feel that uh, we're gonna, they're gonna give us some things that you've never really seen on a, in a movie before. They are supervising from the construction and design of the miniatures to the actual shooting of all the elements to the compilation of all the elements. They're doing all of it. It's important that you have a holistic view of, of the entire visual effects process. What's the objective? is to create a credible illusion. We've really done our work properly when you watch this film and, and maybe the thought balloon is, I didn't see any effects in that film. Dale's been watching our hind end quite a bit actually lately and, and been, he's been very enthusiastic about it the whole way too. Um, knows what we have to do, knows the details of stuff, knows the minutia involved. He's been just enjoying it. Steve was looking for someone who didn't default to a digital solution every time there was a visual effect required. He knows that when you point a camera at a real thing, you can tweak the lighting and adjust it and get it looking right. Whereas a lot of digital effects just kind of get hammered out in anonymously in some place and it arrives almost as a fait accompli. From the outset, Steve was very strongly of the view that a, a large miniature ship would be used and potentially additional miniatures or miniature components of the ship for more detailed work. That was almost a, you know, a stated requirement of the equation. What you see behind us is the uh, Antonio Grassa uh, miniature. Um, miniature. It's about it's about 60 feet long, you know, and, and it weighs it weighs it weighs tons. This boat is complex in both its complexions. It exists as a brand new ocean liner at the beginning of the film. It also exists as a 50-year-old floating rust bucket, and in both conditions, it's immensely detailed, which makes it an extremely complicated object. It's the actual broken bits of furniture. It's the collapsed staircases. The coiled up rusted wires and things, the geometry to replicate something like that in a 3D CGI model would be enormous. You go through computer graphics and there's a, a variety of reasons why you use them, um, but to a large degree it's because the shapes within the computer graphics are changing constantly. The Antonio Graza is a static object, you only had to build one of them. I think personally it photographs better. I think you have more control over the texture, it, you have more control over the detail. Tom had worked on Moulin Rouge and prior to that had done Matrix. He'd built the uh, very famous helicopter that's crashing into the side of the building. I was very fortunate to put a, such a, an excellent team together. About a team of 23 of us eventually. We started off with the boat and uh, one tenth scale tug pretty much at the same time. We're using the model twice. I mean, rather than just see it as a hero, beautiful ship. We get to see it as two ships. Composites are all about layering and layering and layering so that you get that complexity and, and, and fractal thing that you get in the real world, you know, that chaos. You know, it's not an A plus B composite, it's an A plus B plus C plus, or the whole alphabet a couple of times over. 
We've travelled up and down the coast shooting both terrestrially and off boats and from helicopters, getting the, the piece of water in which this imaginary ship must sail. We had the luxury of being able to motion track the, uh, the, the proxy vessels that we had in the water, determine the motion tracking paths, communicate that data to our motion control systems and have them replicate the move of the camera boat or the camera helicopter uh, with a large scale miniature. That gave us everything we wanted. At the climax of this film we have the lead actress having to escape from a sinking ship underwater. So clearly that's something that has to be filmed underwater, but we don't really have the means to sink a large ship. In this particular instance she's been accompanied by hundreds of ghosts. Uh, and all of these ghosts are fleeing the sinking ship also. All of our ghost effects are, are derivative from physical uh, props or actors. The grace and beauty of what we're calling ghost time is, is in how, how we take that live action footage and affect it. You have to do a lot of homework with that stuff. You have to prepare a lot for it pretty, pretty carefully or else it will turn out poorly and you're losing a shot and once you're losing a shot the movie's over. A lot of the work on this film, I'm really hoping the audience will never grasp that they've seen an illusion until they watch this DVD, perhaps. 